bubonic plague was one of the worst natural disasters humanity has ever faced. Over the course of 500 years, it would claim over 31 million European lives. Plague first made its way into Europe through the bites of fleas that left their rodent hosts to then infect the bodies of humans with their bite. The fleas were infested with a strain of the bacteria Yersinia pestis. This bacteria would cause the fleas' digestive tract to clog, resulting in a ravenous hunger. As the fleas bit into their new host, the bacteria would cause them to vomit their infected bile into the wound. This meant that every bite was potentially fatal. At the time, medical practitioners were not aware of the possibility for infections to be transmitted via parasites, and instead thought the sickness was transmitted through contact with bad air or miasma. Miasma, a most subtle, peculiar, insinuating, venomous, deleterious exhalation arising from the maturation of the ferment of the feces of the earth. Miasma theory was in fact the commonly accepted medical reasoning behind the spread of plague and other such diseases until late in the 19th century. At the time, miasma was typically understood as responsible for many diseases, including malarial fever, typhoid, diarrhea, and dysentery. The practice of bloodletting was a common method said to ward off the disease as it was believed the procedure could rebalance the body's humours. Widely practiced since its inception around 500 AD, humorism was a system that believed in the necessity of a balance between the levels of a body's blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. While this rudimentary form of medical theory finds little use today, its effects can still be seen in the names for diseases such as malaria, translating literally as bad air in medieval Italian. Plague continued to circle its way around Europe for centuries. On average, once every 10 years, there would be a significant outbreak of plague within one of the major cities. In London, there were at least 20 attacks of plague in the 15th century. As reported by the chroniclers at the time, the mortality figures were so incredibly high that modern scholars long regarded them with skepticism. Recent detailed and rigorously conducted analysis indicate, however, that many of the reports were substantially correct. This constant commune with death took its toll on the population in more than just body count. In 1592, London locals would be provided with access to a bill of mortality, a weekly sheet listing mortality statistics with particular emphasis given to the notation of plague victims. It is difficult to imagine the terror experienced by people in those conditions. According to historian William Langer, almost everyone in that medieval time interpreted the plague as a punishment by God for human sins. In an attempt to bring solace to the suffering, the medieval church would often send out publications to its clergy to guide the congregation's mass. In Salus Populi, a mass against the plague, a prayer was sent out to be read. Almighty and merciful God, Look upon the people subject to your majesty, and may the receiving of your sacrament prevent the fury of cruel death from coming upon us. Limited medical understanding meant that there was little in the way of preventative measures taken to protect the population. This fact expedited the spread of plague as the disease began to spread as a result of human contact as well as fleas. 
Thousands of men, women, and children died within the overcrowded and often poorly planned cities. In order to combat the spread of infection, local constituencies would often employ the services of medical practitioners to treat the destitute and the dying. Despite their title, those who undertook the task of a plague doctor were rarely certified physicians. Initially, those poor souls were no more protected from the disease than the local population as they walked their way through the beleaguered streets of dying cities. In an effort to establish some measure of protection for the plague doctors, a prominent French medical doctor, Charles Delorme, devised a uniform that would theoretically help to protect those who ventured into the forsaken streets. As the personal physician to three French kings, Delorme's designs for what he considered armour against the plague were quickly established throughout Europe. While his design did provide a small measure of protection for the wearer by arming them with a cane to limit human contact, the uniform lacked protection for the ankles, a favourite location for the fleas to attack. Undoubtedly, the most iconic aspect of Delorme's design was the curved beak into which sweet-smelling herbs would be placed in order to lessen the effects of miasmic air. The belief was that the scent of the herbs would counter the rancid smell of bad air and so protect its wearer from the toxic fumes. In reality, the heavy-set clothing and the fact that they were rarely washed in all likelihood led to an increase in the plague's spread. Doctors moving between different communities would inadvertently carry both bacteria and fleas within their garments into areas that may have yet been unaffected. As a result, plague doctors would often become associated not with the prevention, but with the onset of plague. The visage of their infamous curved beak remains to this day an icon of ignorance and fear. Today, germ theory and the advent of the scientific method have fundamentally changed the way our society views the world in which we live. Ready access to antibiotics and vaccinations have dulled the edge of pandemics faced by our ancestors. From the black waxed robes of speculation to the white lab copes of experimentation, the lessons we learn from the past have been engraved into our culture and will serve as an eternal reminder of our progress. Modern medicine may still have its own demons in superbugs and genetic alteration, but only time will tell how future generations will look back and view our struggles.